Hi everybody, George here for the Polyglot George channel and today I want to talk about something that I thought about while I was in Korea. I just got back, I was there for a month, I was learning Chinese uh, for some reason. I thought Chinese would be a good thing to do in Korea and one of the main reasons was I wanted to use my Korean to learn Chinese and I thought that would actually enhance my Korean and I did learn a lot more Korean doing the Chinese thing and I, and I did learn some Chinese. But now I'm back and while I was there um, I was getting a Thai massage one night. I love massages. And for about $65, you can get an hour and a half massage at this place in Gangnam, where I stay. And I was getting this amazing massage. And during each painful fit where the girl had me uh, totally bent up like a pretzel, I thought, wow, it would be interesting if I could talk to this person in Thai. Because she was an actual, I shouldn't say girl, she was a woman. I would like to be able to talk to her in Thai, but I couldn't. And then I thought, wow, that alone is enough for me to want to learn Thai, just because this girl, this woman, is giving me a massage and I like Thai massages. That's enough. And then I thought, well, what other sparks or flashpoints would make someone want to learn a language? So I started thinking about myself. So today we're going to talk about flashpoints. Uh, and basically, like I just said, all that is is what got you into the language. And it's going to be different for everyone. Uh, as I taught Japanese over these last... Uh, 18 or so years, I've heard Pokemon being one of the reasons, you know, they had Pokemon cards and they wanted to know what was set on the back of those cards. I've heard people say they were watching uh, Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball Z is what we call it here, with their children and they wanted to know what they were saying without subtitles, which is a hefty, hefty goal, but it's a flashpoint nonetheless. So let's talk about personal flashpoints for myself. And then I would love to hear your flashpoints too at the bottom here in the comments. Uh, for me, uh, when I was nine, for Nihongo, Japanese, my father asked me one day, he said, would you like to go to Japan? And I had a fish at the time, and my, my only concern was, can I bring the fish to Japan? We were going to go to Okinawa. Man, I should have went. But my dad said I couldn't bring my fish, so we didn't go. And that delayed my starting of learning Japanese by three years, unfortunately. Luckily... Three years later, he asked me again, and I think this time uh, it was worth a lot more money to him because he was a civilian, and uh, I think no matter what I would have said, we would have went, and we went. Now, a funny thing about that is it's not really a flashpoint for me uh, because I, I was thrown into a situation where learning the language was kind of expected, okay, as I was still very young. But when you learn multiple languages, a weird thing happens. They start calling you genius when you're good at them. And Japanese people will say it to you, Korean people will say it to you, and I imagine once my Chinese is better, you'll hear it. I'll hear it from them. And if you know languages well, they'll say you're a language genius. But that's really not the case. It's just that you put time into it. Much like, you know, uh, you, you wouldn't call a ballerina a genius or a natural, you know, because she's good at ballerining. Is that a word? I don't know. But, you know, obviously she put in years, she put in, or he put in 10 or 15 years into being a ballerina. Uh, so that's why they're good, and of course it looks like they're a genius. Well, it's the same thing with language. Uh, I forgot my main point. Ah, I remember. My main point was, for me, a sort of a flashpoint for Japanese, if there was one, was that before I went to Japan, I used to make my own alphabets. I was a little bit strange, I was an only child, forgive me for that. But I would make alphabets. I would write these alphabets, and they were just simple. A is this, B is that. They were just replacing the actual English alphabet with what looked like hieroglyphics, okay? And I would write these, and then I would write these long, extensive letters, fold them up, and then float them down this river near my house. Because I felt like that's how the aliens would pick up my message. Um, I even had the planets picked out in the sky, knew where they were. Uh, I even drew out the animals on the planet, and the animals even had, you know, animals that fed off of those animals. It was very intricate. I had a very good imagination, I guess, for that age. And my father thought for sure I was crazy. Going to Japan, though, did an interesting thing. That energy that I was putting into this fake language, where I used to, I used to keep in my back pocket the cipher of this language, uh, became Japanese. Everyone in Japan had this cipher. It was hiragana and katakana and kanji. And to me, it was like, wow. And I know it's hindsight for me to say this now, but if I look back at it, it's, it's like, wow, other people have this language thing too. 
Uh, so for me, learning Japanese was a natural thing for me at that point. So uh, after Nihongo, uh, I went for about 28 years or so and didn't learn anything else. Then I was 39 and a 14 year old half Japanese girl named Minna sent me a video over Skype. She said, check this guy out, he's so cool. And I know what you're thinking, 14 year old half Japanese girl, what are you doing George? No, 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 family friend. Known her since she was four, but she sent me this video, and it was my first exposure to Korean music, K-pop. And the guy was Young was just just dancing like it's the song "Where You At," and it's an amazing dance number. And I was impressed. And then I clicked the next video, Wonder Girls, and then I clicked Son Yoshide, which is Girls Generation. If you haven't seen Girls Generation, go look. Just like Girls Generation, O. Oh, it's like O H. Just, oh, oh wait, it'll come up. That video sold me because I like girls. And that sold me. That was, I believe that's my complete flashpoint. Okay? And then for weeks I was downloading K pop all the time. And, but even then I wasn't really trying to learn a language. I just had a fascination with Korea as a country and never understood that Korea uh, was appealing like that. You know? I grew up in Japan. And there's a, there's, you know, I was into J pop. And into all of the you know, Morning Musume, AKB48, all of those really cutesy, cutesy girl groups. But what Korea did was show me a whole different type of pop that I had never seen before. Because if you've seen Japanese pop, it's, it's, it's really geared towards the cute side, right? And they over cutify. Even, even, uh, oh, what's their name? Oh, what's their name of that? Oh, gosh. Baby Metal. Even Baby Metal, which is supposed to be a hard rock girl band, it's, Nickel punch, nickel punch, nickel punch. It's still cute. And everything they do is cute. They take these girls that are 16 or 17 and look like they're 12. And, and I'm not saying bad things about it. It's not wrong. It's just different. You know, but it's just ding, 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 ding. It's embarrassing for me. I can't really show my friends. When I came back to America, I couldn't really say, dude, check this out. This is amazing. Because when I did that, it was like, dude, how old are these girls? Okay. But you could take the same age girl for K-pop. You could have a 16-year-old or a 17-year-old, uh, and they don't look like that. Like, when you look at Japanese girls that are 16 in the video, you're like, dude, she ain't 16, she's like 12. But when you look at Korean girls that are that age, you go, whoa, there's no way she's 16, she's probably 20. Because they're popping and locking. You know, you got 21 with Minji, who's, I think she was like 16 or 15 when she started, and she's amazing. She does not look like a prepubescent girl which is what Japan likes to do. All right, I'm, I'm riffing on K-pop and J-pop. My point being that uh, Flashpoint for Japanese wasn't J-pop, but it kept me going, but K-pop really got me into Korean. And that's what keeps me going, uh, or kept me going for quite some time because I got some friends. Um, although, you know, kind of a funny thing. I had a flashback about two years ago because I always thought that Japanese was the first foreign writing system that I learned, but it turns out it wasn't. When I was 12, my dad would send me the babysitters in Japan when he was working. After school, I would go to one of the houses on the military airbase that we were at, and it was a Korean woman. The Korean woman babysat me, and she taught me hangul. She taught me this, hangul. I was learning hangul, I remember, because I remember it was a chart, it had letters like H, K, you know, it, it was the chart that I learned for Hangul when I first learned Korean. I learned it. I don't remember it, but that was my first... I mean, it took me like 27 more years to get back into Korean. And I wish I would have done it earlier. I wish I would have done it, you know, 10 years ago when I was doing videos with uh, a Korean girl on the uh, George and Keiko show on YesJapan.com. If you know who I am, you know who that is, don't worry about it. But if you look, if you type in George and Keiko, we'll come up and you'll see. You might catch a video with me and the Korean girl. Uh... I should have learned that, but I didn't. That should have been a flashpoint, but it wasn't. All right. Um, I want to say something just for a second before I get to Zhongwen. So, with Zhong, Zhongwen, all right. With Chinese, something changed inside of me. For my entire life, I was, well, I would say for my entire life, but from 12 and up, when I got good at Japanese, I was George the Japanese speaker. These books in the back, these are books that I've written, Japanese were my first eight books, right? Or my first seven books. They're all Japanese. 
my website's Japanese. The first 600 videos I ever made are all about learning Japanese, right? So that's my entire image. So it came as quite a change in my life when I became Korean George, when that guy was born, because it had a hard time initially coexisting with Japanese George. But then I became Japanese Korean George, this combo person. And I think, I think where I'm trying to go with this is, is, is a message to those of you that are, the, I think there's a few, a few of you that don't know another language and want to, but think you're not good at it. And you, you say it all the time, you say, I'm not, I'm not good at language. You need you to stop that right now. I absolutely need you to stop that. Because um, the power of positive thought is completely true. All right. Uh, four or five years ago, I watched The Secret and it changed my life. There's a movie, a documentary called The Secret. There's a book called The Secret. And I learned for the first time about the power of positive thought and the power of... Um, Attracting good things in your life, and it, it's hokey. I mean, when you if you don't, if you haven't watched it and you haven't experienced it, it's new agey hokey, and I don't even agree with all parts of that video because I believe you have to also put effort forward. I don't think you can just imagine uh, that it's going to happen. But there are certain things that if you do, completely change your perspective. And I'm going to tell you one right now that happened only in about the last two months. And this channel, this channel that you're watching this video on right now, or the Facebook. Uh, that you're subscribed to for Polyglot George is a complete reason uh, or complete proof for me. Uh, so I was, until two months ago, I was Japanese Korean George, okay? Then I started learning Chinese and I thought, well, gosh, I guess now I'm a polyglot. So I got Polyglot George the domain, I got Polyglot George the Facebook, and I got the YouTube channel, right? No intention, by the way, of making money with it. It's just I want to talk about languages and I don't have an outlet that isn't purely Japanese or purely Korean. I want to talk about everything. And I want to talk long form like we're doing now. But something happened inside of me. I became <clears throat> Polyglot George. I didn't become two languages outside of English George. And that changed my entire mental thought. I, my self-image changed. So now... Languages that I never thought I was interested in, for example, Spanish. I don't care about Spanish. I never did. Well, I, when I was younger, uh, when I was living in my father's house before we went to Japan, or actually when I came back from Japan, there was a family living in my house, renting a room, uh, a lovely family from Mexico. They had a four-year-old daughter. I played with her all the time, and she was my mariposa. And I, I used to say all the Spanish, you know, el caballo, ¿dónde estás el caballo? I would say stupid things like that, and I was learning to say... Spanish, but I wasn't really interested beyond that. And for 20 years, I've said Spanish, boring, boring. Why well, to learn it? Everyone knows Spanish. But now that I'm a polyglot, well, you know what? I feel like it's a prerequisite that a polyglot needs to know Spanish. So I went from not knowing or not having any desire to do this and not even thinking it would be possible to now it's possible. So I want you to from this day forward, if you are the person that says you can't do it or it's too hard, just stop saying that. Instead of saying, I'm not good, saying start saying, I'm not good yet. Uh, I'm still working. I'm working on it. Yeah, I get better every day. I get better every day. I get better every day. And say, say this lie. I study every day. I study every day. And do it. Just take a little bit of time every day and study. Mean what you say. And fake it until you make it is totally true. All right. I didn't want to get all philosophical, but uh, stop it. I, I hate when people say that. I wish I was like you, but I'm just not good with languages. Don't. Don't go there, please. All right. Chinese. Chinese is a natural extension um, when you know Korean and Japanese. Japanese has a lot of Chinese characters. Those Chinese characters for me completely powered up my Korean. I can... I can think of a word in Japanese and fake it into Korean and nine times out of ten I'll figure out the Korean word because it's a, I know what, how the sounds convert from Japanese. A lot of kanji words or what they call it in Korean is hanja, they do that and it's great. It's like, it's like a magic parter trick that I can do in the bar, you know, with friends. Whoa, watch this juggling. But it's amazing. So it's a natural extension to do Chinese because Chinese is all Chinese characters, okay? Um, and that's, I guess that's basically my flashpoint on that. I mean, 
I did have interest. I did have interest maybe 20 years ago, too. I went to Taiwan. And I was watching a Japanese TV show called um, Uchan Nanchan. No, Hono no Challenger. And on Hono no Challenger, they had two groups Poke, Biscuit, Poke Biscuits and uh, Black Biscuits. And one of the girls in the group was Vivian Su, who's a very famous Taiwanese singer. And she was beautiful and funny. And I fell in love with her. And I remember when I went to Taiwan for one interpreting job. I remember I got on the bus and I went to the Tower Records, which was actually there at Tower Records, and I went to buy Vivian Su, and I remember the whole time trying to use Chinese, which I didn't know any Chinese. But that could have been a flashpoint, but it wasn't. It wasn't. Um, I didn't mean to make this about what I didn't do to learn Chinese, but now I'm into Chinese. What about Russian? Well, Russian's a stupid, I mean, it's a stupid reason. I never had any desire to do Russian, but we are developing a game here at the company. And the game is a, a, a game to teach languages. But we all have a variety of level of language in this company. I know Japanese. Uh, my partner, Justin, knows Japanese. So we couldn't develop on Japanese because my level's high and his is kind of high and it's not challenging. Uh, and then Chinese. He knows way more Chinese than me. I know no Chinese. Can't do that. I thought initially Thai. But nah, let's not do Thai. We, it's another Asian language. So we, but we, we decided on Russian. That's it. Now I'm into Russian. And then didn't, it didn't hurt that there's a show called The Americans that I like to watch on TV. And there's a lot of cool Russian characters in there. It's about, um, it's about a, a couple of, a family of Russian spies that are in the 80s. Um, it's like a period piece where the spies are, you know, they're dealing with the, the Cold War. And there's a lot of Russian in it. And it's real Russian. It's not the fake stuff. Like, like a lot of TV shows will do fake language. Like, Anata wa nani o shiterun desu ka? You know, or Hangugo Charhashine yo. It's it's not real Russian or, or Korean or Japanese, it's fake. But American audiences don't know any better. Thai, I already told you. A good flashpoint for me is just literally Thai massage. It's stupid. Vietnamese. Why would I want to learn Vietnamese? Is this the Vietnam War? No. I randomly met two Vietnamese girls in the airport in Korea. They were so adorable. They were sisters and they were heading to Japan and they were confused about how to use the machine. They didn't know Chinese, Japanese, Korean, English, or anything I tried. So I had to use Google Translate. And I thought, man, it would just be convenient if I knew Vietnamese. So I'm curious, um, what's your flashpoint? What keeps you going in a language? Um, tell me. Tell us in the comments. Try to not make it long. Just keep it simple, like, uh, for this language, this. For this language, that. Let me know. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all on the next Polyglot George. Bye.